What's up, punks? It's Shinobi. Uh, today is Friday, November 1st, and we are bringing you a very special edition of Block Digest, in my opinion, with a Mr. Vizik, who has been balls deep in the collectibles uh, side of the crypto space since 2013. Uh, so I think this is going to be really interesting if you're into that whole social side of what's going on in the ecosystem. So uh, what's going on, Busy? Yeah, hi, yeah. Yeah, that's a pretty accurate uh, shot there. I've been doing the collectibles a bit a while, gets addictive. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of in the blood, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's going to be for everybody in this space to some degree i mean that's that, that's what this all started off as us collecting entries in a database <laughs> yeah and and now of course uh, the the classic trope is uh, stack sats so collect 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 and i think that's uh, something we all can um work with mm -hmm. so uh i've, I've actually uh, got a whole like uh I guess notepad and, and a bunch of topics written out and stuff for this, which is something I rarely do for interviews. <laughs> so uh, I guess, you know, kind of to start off, I guess uh, I'm, I'm going to put this out there as a dealer's choice for you, Zeke. Uh, either let, let's jump into kind of the, the history of the first real physical collectibles in the space or uh, kind of go through how you like came to to Bitcoin and then fell into the, the whole collectible scene. Ah, oh, yeah, good choice. Um, how did I get into Bitcoin? Let's start with that one. Always a good one, isn't it? Personal journey. I heard about it in 2011. I have a cousin who's a, a developer and was getting into cryptography and had come across Bitcoin. And he said, check this out. This is really cool. And I was like, yeah, no, it's not happening. Um, and and just didn't really have time in my life at the time. I was working in an IT department in a hospital, so life was pretty busy there. Plus, I was an on-call engineer. So, yeah, it didn't kind of align with where my head was at. Mm -hmm. And then 2012 came around, and um, he came back, and he was like, no, seriously, you've really got to check this out. So it was like, yeah, 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 all right. So over the course of about another six months, I gave it, some time and effort and then of course it's that thing isn't it with bitcoin the penny drops and you're like this is it i've been looking for this um and from that point forward i just kind of fell down the rabbit hole and wanted to learn everything and it's been kind of a an a level as we say in in the uk um education on lots of different disciplines because obviously bitcoin demands that you have an understanding of quite a few things if you're going to be especially if you're going to be working in the space so yeah and by i, I started mining but litecoin naturally because by Aww. about what was it yeah unfortunately by about this time it was 2013 so i'd kind of missed the boat really um but it was a good education in in what mining is as you know the technology the idea and everything else so it i, I don't consider that waste effort by by a long stretch but um, it was also good fun, but very expensive on the electric bill because um, it wasn't the cheapest of places to mine. Um, and then, yeah, I, I really developed from there, at which point I got involved with Bitcoin on a more professional level and started and also collecting and noticed after joining Bitcoin talk that there were collectibles and this and that. And it was like, well, this looks like fun because I used to collect Star Wars cards in the old age. And I know a bunch of you guys are going to be very familiar with that. It's so, magic for me. Yeah, there you go. So y you understand where I'm coming from in that respect. It's like, you know, oh, I need a couple more to complete the set. Oh, and now there's another color set. And it goes on and you want to complete it. And hey, presto. So, of course, Bitcoin didn't have that many collectibles in the early, early days. The obvious one being Cassius. Um, but he wasn't actually the first physical crypto that hit the scene. There was actually something called BitBills, and they're highly prized and sought after. 
Um, and if you look on the um, Bitcoin Talk Forum collectible section, they crop up occasionally and they always attract a good premium. Um, but yes, then Casatius Coins was actually my very first ever physical collectible. I, funnily enough, I bought it off eBay when that was possible because um, you can't buy um, Casatius Coins and physical crypto on eBay anymore. They will clamp down on that. One of those things mm. about the chain how things change over time um, and, and the kind of they're the hurdles we also have to work against obviously how do you sell these things so it, it's it's been quite a ride from from yeah 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 I'll get around to it to oh my god this is awesome um, and then collecting stuff and then making a business out of it which was what I went on to do with a company called Fizzybit which uh, is still operational online I no longer own it I might add but it's uh, the objective was to sell Bitcoin goods from the highly prized collectibles like some of the more esoteric uh, Bitcoins, Casasius et al. To also the obvious stuff like merchandise, you know, so that if you're putting on a gig or you just want some fancy something to wear like a T-shirt, there was something there. Because at the time it was quite an underserved opportunity on the Internet. Yeah, so kind of like a, a, a bizarre for everything from the, the common to the, the completely obscure. Yeah, exactly. And and it's that thing. What, what I found was is that I used to go to quite a few conferences from about 2014 onwards. Like I went to the, in fact, the Bitcoin Foundation Amsterdam conference, which is the first time the foundation had ever been outside the USA. Woo! Um, <laughs> it was kind of a big deal. Um, so we all trekked over there and got to meet and uh, greet quite a few people um, in the scene and put faces to names and the like. Um, and And actually talking to people and you you discuss things like oh yeah check out this coin or whatever and they'd look at you kind of nonplussed which was kind of for two reasons one what you're talking about a digital a asset that's actually physical was that then and the fact that these guys just hadn't heard of anything like that before anyway um and so it was quite clear to me that as an opportunity there was there was certainly a business to be had in supplying the physical elements of, of our virtual world to people because um, some of this stuff was really nice. In fact, like um, Kialara, he made some really cool stuff in 2014 um, and nobody was, well, bar a small bubble on the collectible circle and, and his, his immediate social circle, it was kind of limited. That's what it felt like. Um, and so if you expand the reach of these goods into more conferences, more public and everything else, there, there, there was an opportunity. It was, I was right. It, it worked quite well. Um, and of course, then you get growing interest in art, which has become very much a new thing with things like, um, well, I say new thing, it's been around a few years, but um, a, a greater amount of interest in the more recent past with things like NFTs and uh, websites like CryptoVoxels and Super Rare and Known IO and Unknown IO. So yeah, it, it's a burgeoning market and an interesting field to be working in. Yeah, I mean, it, it really has like intertwined deep into the culture. Like I, I volunteered at the Magical Crypto Conference this year. It's like, the, you know, the first, you know, one of these conferences, and it's like they, they had art exhibits and stuff all over the place like crypto, or crypto graffiti was there it actually did an auction in between um you know some of the talks for one of his pieces and stuff and it was like a whole like focal point of the the conference and it's like they're doing their first conference and it's like yep okay this has got to be like here in the middle of it like it's just that embedded into the the, the culture as it is now yeah, and one thing I'll say about uh, one of the conferences we have over here in the UK, CoinFest in Manchester, um, the guy that runs that, Adam, he's very much had his finger on the pulse there with the art scene as well. He's always had um, an art exhibition alongside the main conference. And I've um, taken a number of works because I'm a collector and dealer in, in some of this stuff. So I've said, well, look, you know, we'll bring some stuff up, make it more interesting. And 
um, you've had uh, exhibitors like Trevor Jones, who's um, one of the current hot AR artists. Um, yeah, so it it's good to see how art has um, started to be more of a thing rather than something that people just didn't pay attention to. Um, and I think it's it's as more artists do come on stream, the ones that shine are the ones that understand Bitcoin conceptually and and as well as the obvious literally and physically if you like but it's the conceptual stuff that can the rabbit hole we fell down you know if they can put that on canvas or or on in some format then they're going to be the ones that shine in, in my opinion mm -hmm. all right so let's kind of shift gears to the the, the drop choice from, from dealer's choice earlier you know, like one one of the most interesting things to me about like the whole like collectible and like art scene in this ecosystem is like where it started with like the, those things like the the bit bill and the cassatious coins because it's like that 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 first place where this all started was like the meeting of the the physical and this new digital thing and like the the way that it happened is just like the most ironic thing in the world to me because it's like let's take this trustless thing or like not, not literally trustless but heavily trust minimized thing that's totally digital and let's tie it to the physical by introducing just complete dependence on trust you know like what, what was that like going going through that and like how that whole valuation of that started developing Yeah, good question. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one because obviously, when you're you're putting, you're taking a huge amount of putting a, a huge amount of trust rather into a a single point of failure like the creator. Um, it kind of breaks everything that we've been trying to learn about Bitcoin, doesn't it? It's it's kind of the main problem physicals as a rule um, unless you've made the keys and you've hidden them and sealed them underneath the hologram then technically um, you, you've created a risk and how great is that risk or how much do you trust the person that made them i.e mike caldwell in this particular instance um, i think in the early days but one of the things about mike was that he, he obviously took all of this stuff very seriously and being at the vanguard of the scene there were so many eyes watching that was like to to have actually have made any cock-ups he would have been pulled apart pretty damn quick um and in fact as as a collector now it's it's noticeable that his coins still carry the best premiums and the maximum amount of trust at the moment because there are no known issues of the Sasius coins being duplicated in terms of the the fraud or swept uh, as other makers have swept theirs. There's a, a case in point, Alatin Mint had some of theirs swept. Um, whereas no Cassatius coin has ever been swept in that manner. So there, yeah, it's trust, trust is really a very difficult thing when you're talking about collectibles. It's, it's the old mantra, not your keys, not your Bitcoin. And if you didn't make the keys, can you trust that the only copy is the one that you have and that the person that created it didn't make a copy it's a you could go round and round and round so you make a judgment call on risk don't you as a collector as a buyer so the the you, you factor in risk to the price um and history so things like btcc have good risk profiles because they haven't been intruded they haven't been swept etc Whereas other coins like Allerton Mint, you probably would only pay for the value of the coin um, and unlikely you would pay for any digital on it. You would probably expect it to have been swept. There are ways of doing it, but how can you? Uh, it's a, yeah, it's a hard one to manage. Mm -hmm. So it's really like the, the core part of this is like the, the reputation. Like, you know, this is a place where the, the, the concept of the web of trust is pretty much the, the foundation of, of value in this space. 
Oh, absolutely. In, ter in collector's terms, yes. And uh, it's interesting how that actually has become a, a deeper conversation in terms of provenance, because obviously if a, a, a basic brass Cassasius coin with a hologram on the back can potentially be worth one million dollars because of the one Bitcoin on it, then the motivation for counterfeiting and fraud are obviously immensely high. And as you would obviously gather, if you're making one, you're going to be making quite a few. So the, the custody chains within a number of these loaded collectibles are going to be essential um, because copies, uh, a number of these coins have been photographed over time. So there will be potential to make replicas of them. So you're going to be able to, the provenance of anything that you own, loaded that is loaded cassasius coins or loaded collectibles you will need to have a strong provenance and custody chain to prove that you actually have owned it bought it from rectal sources etc bit like you do with art now to be brutally honest um yeah it, you know if you rock up to a gallery with a casso they're going to know exactly where it came from mm -hmm. yeah like you know in the, in the long term i mean you know like this kind of issue um sort of you know exists with the uh comic book industry and, you know they have the the c uh cgc that actually acts as like an authority to like grade and rate the quality of uh specific copies of a comic book and actually seal them and put their official stamp on them and it's like if, if these collectibles don't get cannibalized and disappear just for the, the Bitcoin, I mean, it's, I, I see a necessity for something like that in the long term. Well, there, there are grading services. Um, you have a company called ICG, which is the current favorite of a lot of their coin collectors who get their coins graded there. Um, there are others. Um, Annex was a popular one for a while. Um, their services can be variable. Um, all grading services have their particular version or, or way of doing things as as has been proven over time by various coin collectors is that what may get a 67 grade by one grader will get a 69 or even a 70 which is the max you know ms 70 is the max grade for a, a coin um it, it can be very subjective which uh, in the num numismatic field is not uncommon um but yeah, as as we move into other collectibles, like there are things like cards and and certain books, in fact, and comics, as they appear in physical form, they get wrapped up and graded as well. Um, it is a thing. It is being done by some of the more um, long term collectors. These guys are, in fact, comic collectors and coin collectors, baseball card collectors. Some of these guys that are involved in the scene have been doing collecting as a thing for a very long time mm -hmm. so you know b before we kind of shift a little bit into like some uh some of the other kind of stuff out there they like, uh you know like I, I know this is like not something you're going to be able to do super comprehensively on the spot but like you know could you just rattle off like you know the the physical coins like you're aware of besides the cassatius coins or the, the btcc ones like you know because I, I i have a feeling there's a lot more of those out there than people like me are aware of yeah no problem hang, hang on a second All right um you've got bit piece you've got casasius you've got crypto imperator he's uh, a spanish guy that makes quite a few coins you've got the finnish guys called denarium you've got an old project called friends of satoshi that were trying to tie in physicals with art which was quite a good project that unfortunately didn't get much of it took very far lealana based in hawaii although smoothie's gone quite Quite more recently, Chris Soul led by Gravitate, which was uh, a good example of how not to do things. Um, you've got Soul Notis, which are just about to release a new bull coin, um, which is their second coin after the Binary Eagle, which was very popular. Um, TG Bex, based out of the Isle of Man, they were very popular around 2014, 2015. 
not many end up ended up being issued but they're pretty cool coins and you've got titan mint titan mint were a very good mint i'm not sure if they still make any at this time but their earlier coins are very nice classical designs with things like mercury on uh, the god mercury um also had things like um poker chips and in fact btcc mint moon bits and satori coin uh, are the, the popular three there um they were pretty cool uh, btc see shut down due to regulatory issues as did satori coin they were shut down due to regulatory issues currently moon bits um, are the only ones that are issuing loaded poker chips around about 0 0.001005 um, but they're quite cool they're uh, metallic co and coated chips with value on them mm -hmm. yeah I, I really wanted to get uh, one of those satori coins uh, just because the the, the uh, quote on it, um, what was it? Uh, value only exists inside the minds of men. But like I, I just could not find a way to get one at a, at a premium. I found acceptable until they disappeared, and then whoosh, that that premium skyrocketed. But yeah. Uh, so it's, like, it's outside of the consciousness of men yeah yeah the, there we go that, that, that was it but um yeah you know so we've we've been talking a bit about like coins uh but like what well, well, there's been a couple other different mediums uh that the people have kind of tied keys to like i know there's a number of bills out there and i think you were saying the other day like uh you know people hiding keys in like wooden blocks and then weird stuff like that Yeah, well, in fact, uh, it's interesting that Crypto Graffiti has just released um, three new works. Now, I'm a big fan of Crypto Graffiti, I have to say, a bit of a fanboy myself. Mm -hmm. I, own, I own quite a few pieces of his work. Um, and he's just released three new pieces. Um, and on one of them, he's embedded a 24-word seed. And then he's coated it and done various things and put the image that is his work over it and sealed it up. Um, so, yeah, methods of, of transport. And I actually call these transition technologies because it trans it, you, you can look at that a few ways. It's a transition technology as people learn how to use it and give them the opportunity to move the digital from physical into the digital from physical. Um, and then obviously it's also just that that straight vehicle it's an understanding it's a it's a movement so it, you've got things like banknotes um works of art um and those works of art can be anything literally there there are no rules on that people have put things on the back of statues they've put them on the back of works of art embedded things as as cryptography does it seems to be the only limitation to be honest is is the mind of the creator mm -hmm. and it's like you know th this is something we, I, we were talking about yesterday is you know like how how do you value these types of things that that take both the inherent value of the bitcoin that's embedded or stored within them through whatever mechanism and combine that with the inherent value of the art itself and like how, how does that that valuation happen and like the, the kinds of dynamics going on there a uh, good question because it's probably become a bit of a hot topic in a couple of channels i'm talking on um markets obviously drive first um and while you will get certain levels of hype um and excitement and enthusiasm it, it, it's kind of like the old days of the icos and things appear and everyone's like yeah yeah cool buying of that yeah i have a piece of that um it it takes a reasonable while before things settle down the dust settles and people really start to engage in a more i don't know um less enthusiastic manner and a more thoughtful manner at which point they become more discerning um, and as people go, yeah, that was cool, but it doesn't quite hit my buttons. Um, they decide where it all goes. So the valuation is, is always really market driven. What you, you might think that 
particular crypto graffiti pieces some um, other people might not uh, go the price doesn't go as high as if everybody wanted it um but <sighs> If we, you, there are pieces made where where the only way to actually recover the embedded Bitcoin are to destroy them. Um, Kialara did this specifically. As a rule, those pieces are gen from a collector's point of view are generally sold unloaded, um, and it's kind of considered um, not the best form to load them up um, because if if Bitcoin becomes worth say one million we'll always use the one million price and the work of art um also becomes incre uh, in incredibly valuable then you don't really want to be trashing it so it becomes a net loss on the value of the bitcoin you you there is a loss in there so it, it's a tough call embedding bitcoin in into works of art is, is big amounts of bitcoin i would say can be a big risk um but then there's that saying with Bitcoin is like for everyone lost, it makes the rest more valuable. That's that's one of the ideologies we work by. So if you apply that maxim on things like um, a limited edition of 100, that's all, all got a bit of Bitcoin embedded and 50 of them destroy them because they want the Bitcoin out. How much are the remaining 50 worth? Ah, well, let's go and find out on the market. Mm -hmm. But you know, we were we were kind of saying or talking about the the time chain piece, and like I I was more looking at it like, well, you're kind of taking this opportunity cost, like with this time chain piece, like you could destroy it and get those those seed uh, words immediately and get that guaranteed Bitcoin, but the the art and its value is much more uncertain. So like how much, you know what I mean? That Bitcoin's there. So how much value in the art are you destroying to get the Bitcoin? And is it worth the, the risk of, of somebody else being able to like get those seeds by destroying the art? Like what the security trade-off versus the, the value opportunity cost? Well, it's funny because we had a good think about this. And to be brutally honest, with that particular work, we could breach that without actually having to destroy it. <laughs> and I think that actually becomes then part of the conversation, obviously, because then it's like, well, if you could scan the key or find a way to access the key in a way that is non-destructive to the artwork, would you pay that money for that work to be done? Now, that could be MRI, CT, one of the scans, X-ray. Um it would make sense if it's going to cost you, uh, say, 10,000 to get it x-rayed and you're you're saving a work that's worth, say, 25,000, then, yeah, you know, you, you say you, as a gain of 15,000, isn't it? So, um, but how do you value, <laughs> in, in the broader context of your question, is how do you value? It's a tough call. It depends on the artist. Um artists earn their reputation it's that simple um i had a conversation earlier today with somebody and and it was basically i have yet to see an artist burst onto the art scene and immediately be able to charge multiple millions for their work straight out of the gate you have to kind of earn your stripes amongst your peers as well as you know the buyers um it, it it's one of those yeah it's that simple to be brutally honest mm -hmm. you know th this is something that that always that's it fascinates me just from a pure market point of view it's just like markets like this are just they're not anywhere near as big or as liquid as markets for something like a commodity like it's it's just there's so much subjective like some disjointed subjective valuation like relative to the size of markets and how many participants there are and just like the it's just like at a micro scale like watching markets like that is so interesting because it's like you know yeah you know you might not come in and sell a, a piece for a million dollars straight out the gate but you can have some artists just pop in out of nowhere and whoosh you can just start to see the ripple effects that it has through that market. 
yeah i mean uh, it's it's definitely possible that you'll get some talent rock up and make waves I, we've actually seen it recently with a guy called tom bradley in the physical currency um physical bank note scene he makes exceptionally good notes and he's doing nfts version nft versions of them as well he's exceptionally talented and i believe he's actually done work for banks on note design so clearly the guy knows his stuff backwards and inside out um so uh it, yeah, but it's still subjective value. Absolutely. Uh, what, what are people prepared to pay for it? Mm -hmm. That's that's a really, that's an interesting tale. There's somebody who, who designed actual fiat currency just s jumping into a niche opportunity like this in the crypto space. Yeah, he, he certainly made waves instantly. And then obviously he, he raises the bar, of course. That's the other side of this, just from a, as a creator point of view. It's like, you know, there have been some good notes out there. I mean, I play about for fun, but I'm just using Photoshop. There are guys out there that are using Illustrator like, and, and all the fancy tools and all the, the, the secrets and tricks like Polymer Bit, for example. Um, and then Tom Bradley comes along and goes, yeah, and checks out. And it's like, wow, this is good stuff. There is, there, um, it, it's amazing to see the creativity that arrives in the scene when people realize that, that the opportunities that are available um, and the physical elements of a digital world are still going to be around for some time. The the whole, the banknote idea is is the simplest um, way of, of kind of explaining and highlighting and showing how physical still has a place for a while lo longer and is a good mechanism to onboard or at least get ownership of um, Bitcoin into the hands of the lesser skilled or the lesser knowledgeable. Um, and you can tell them to like either not move it or or learn how to move it and then do it later or but it gives you that that vehicle um so i think they're going to be around same with the poker chips that's why they're popular as well the satori's and and the btcc and the like um is is that that useful trans again transition technologies transport technologies of getting value are moved around while people learn and try to interact with the, this new world of bitcoin yeah, you, you you and me have had a long debate about that, and I think that the place I, I grudgingly left it was, you're probably right, but I absolutely do not like the idea of of something not in, not involving people creating their own keys, getting that big, but... It should be between right. trusted parties. Yeah, I, I agree. It should be between trusted parties. And the emphasis should always be on it's only temporary. This is not a long term solution. This is something that, you, you know, you're kind of uh, as much as handing over the money, you're, you're handing over an obligation um, and, and an expectation for, of them to learn and like get your shit sorted out and learn this stuff because it's important. Um, obviously, you know, it's ultimately their choice, um, but it's also their loss. But it's, uh, yeah, uh, uh, they do have a place, but uh, yeah, not long term. Mm -hmm. All right. You, you kind of opened the door a bit uh, with the uh, the fiat uh, jumper to, to non-fungible tokens and that kind of uh, digital art side of things. And, you know, you said to me the other day, you weren't really too big of a fan of these kinds of things. But I, I got to say, I love me my rare Pepe's. Like, to, to see a 4chan meme like that just turn into an economic phenomenon with with, it, with this shit was, was amazing to me. And yet, yeah, let, let, let me clarify. It's like, not a fan of collecting but I don't have any issues with the, the, the whole art form. And you're absolutely right. But Pe Rare Pepe is brilliant. Um, it's just that something that as a collector, it's not something that I've gone for. So rather than collect NFL cards, I've gone for the baseball cards, if you like. So j j just to be clear on that. Um, and and the, the link, the whole NFT um, side of art is outstanding because obviously 
Um, we live in an age, as I mentioned earlier, but with, where the motivation, if the motivation is there, counterfeit will surely follow. Um, and so where, where you can now actually assign things a, a digital stamp and it's, it's absolute, then yeah, <laughs> game on. That is a game changer. And it's like the, the thing I think here that's interesting is it's like it's kind of the inverse of of in in a way of, of what we're talking about with the cassatious coins and things like that you know taking the uh the digital and tying to the physical this is just like flipping that on its head and it's like here's just an abstract like token and it's really the the artistic side of it like the the, the digital art and like all of that it's it's they're completely disconnected you know, I mean, like you can print that that picture a million times. It's it, it's, and it's the the totally disconnected, abstracted token that has the the value there. Absolutely. Um, I I I must admit, I question the. Uh, I copied somebody bought a, an NFT object the other day, and I managed to copy it, and and it's like well. Okay, I don't own it. I, I, you know, it's not like I can resell it to anybody. But then, if it was only ever for personal enjoyment, and I just got it banging up on, say, one of these uh, secondary screens that does nothing but roller art on a, on a, on you know a software roller and just plays me the next sheet, the piece, the next piece, the next piece, does it matter? And that that's kind of the deeper debate there, is it not? Um, ownership ownership is. If I if I go to um, a museum and I take a picture of the Mona Lisa, um, or I buy a postcard, I don't even need to take a picture. I buy a postcard and then stick it on my wall. Do I technically own that piece? And that's kind of what I'm driving at: is what what is ownership in the NFT world at the moment? Mm -hmm. I think, like honestly, like this this is something I've thought since I, I disposed of. Uh, all my my Pepe's except a, a joke amount of Pepe cash. I'm I'm gonna keep forever. Uh, <laughs> it's like it, there's gonna be an existential crisis because it's like what's the reason to care about like oh there's some token here that's that's digitally scarce and it's like I I think the only solution uh to that existential crisis is kind of just taking the full plunge into like the cards like people play games with cards like you know what i mean and so in a peer-to-peer -peer basis like you can verify all the cards somebody's playing with are legit before you actually do a game and well hold on these are these are blockchain assets you can you can make smart contracts to have some kind of stake to the game that that executes you know what i mean and like w without really taking it that far like what's the reason to give a shit about the token yeah i <laughs> um from a collectibles point if it's digital scarcity then then it's kind of its own answer isn't it is because people will pay for scarcity but we are it's an, a very nascent industry and i think this is kind of the, the 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 bigger issue i wouldn't say necessarily an issue but it's the bigger thing here is is that we are early early adopters you know bitcoin's only 10 um and so well we're nearly 11 um and this whole art stroke digital collectible scene is even younger and so to put it in context this stuff needs time to earn to learn and to mature because a lot of people and i would imagine quite a lot of assets are still being lost just like early bitcoin was um because everybody's on a learning curve not everybody gets metamask instantly straight out the gate or they don't write down their private keys or blah 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 blah, blah xx reason so I think we've still got a long way to go, and I think you could have the whole: is it is it a UX issue? Is it is it you know is it is it more than that? Is it less than that? But it's education and time. Uh, I think we we still have some way to go before these things are easy enough to be a to be as good as the 
baseball card in a in a chewing gum at the the corner store. Well, I mean, to kind of like jump a little into the future. I mean, like part of my reasoning for like the just this game mechanic, like going all the way. I mean, really think about it with augmented reality pretty much down the horizon. I mean, it, at this point, it's just the software filling in and hardware getting to the point that it's not annoying to have a headset on your head. And have you seen Crypto Space Commander yet? Sorry to interrupt. Have you, uh, have you seen no. Crypto Space Commander? Check it out because it's it's kind of a Star Trek space game um, that uses is assets based on ethereum and you can literally well assets you mine and find you can buy and sell for ethereum um that's pretty cool this whole thing about gaming coming into the new era of crypto assets um the game is literally changing under the feet of some of the the bigger game houses it's quite interesting to watch mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think ethereum is going to be the platform that uh actually works uh for things like that to be built on but i think it, that that's no, coming but it's it's it, it it's a it's again it's kind of that proof of concept isn't it it's like now you know it can be done now we find a better way of doing it so whether that is ethereum a side chain whatever the fact that it's been shown to be doable is the first step because it's like you know but uh, to jump back to the ar stuff it's like imagine magic the gathering in augmented reality like imagine your cards shooting up a hologram of the goblin to go fuck up like your your opponent's griffin and like actually like actually like you know what i mean that right there that is a reason that like i need to give a fuck about this scarcity like that, yeah, that's well, not yeah, going to go away or like peter out into the existential crisis of why. Well, I still think there's enough of us older. I didn't play d and I played another one called Chivalry and Sorcery. But I think there's enough of us old schoolers out there that can see the same vision of what, you, what you've just described and are in positions to be able to do something about it. And I'm pretty sure, yeah, a lot of this new AR, VR stuff is doing just that. Um, in AR terms, as you, you know as well as I do, to be brutally honest, it's it's the only limitation is the creator. That simple. Um, and there's some outstanding talent coming on the stream. I think Josie Bellini is is maybe somebody you've come across, and she makes some really cool artwork that's got AR merged. Yeah, it's gonna get it's gonna get absolutely bonkers, and it's just like yeah. You know, what I mean, right now this this whole thing is just it's it's just a tiny little aspect of the the space that uh not to throw him under the bus. I love Theo, but it's like you 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 say collectibles or something, and people think Theo Goodman and the the Pepe's that exist only to fuck with people and troll them, and it's like it, there's so much more below the surface here that well, this actually stuff is also history. Yeah, like this is this is actually like growth potential into something mainstream. Well, it, look, to be brutally honest, even if it doesn't go mainstream, it's still history and it's still a scarce asset that is ownable. Um, and, and as a result, it might end up being still being niche, like quite a lot of the Bitcoin collectibles are still very niche, but they're highly prized and people pay good money for it. You know, it's get the right item the product and and people pay it's it's that simple um but at the same time when you when you get things like like every a few people go i've got a brass cassasius it must be worth a fortune and it's like well actually no it's not worth probably as much as you think it is but it's still worth more than obviously face value you know so it's yeah as we said earlier it's 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 uh, market forces and a judgment call on value Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something else, you know, we, we've been talking about is the, the kind of premium ratio on these these things that are loaded with Bitcoin and just how, you know, the, the, like you used to have like crazy, like higher than 100% premiums in Bitcoin terms on some of these collectible coins. And now like that, that gap in Bitcoin terms is shrinking 
and just like the, the likelihood that that's just going to become a fiat premium. Yeah, that's currently the way things are actually panning out, to be honest. Um, 10, Casasius, 10 BTC silver gilt coins, once incredibly highly prized at around 19 Bitcoin a coin, um, don't fetch that anymore. They probably will fetch around 13.5 if you're lucky. Um, so as Bitcoins and what really trashed that market, actually, that premium side of things was the bump to twenty thousand um, dollars. When Bitcoin did that, a lot of the premiums just fell out, fell through the floor in a heartbeat and some never recovered. And and in some respects, I, I suppose you could actually argue the market refound itself. So those items considered still to be special um, regained some premium, um, whereas others kind of never really recovered. They've just stayed low eternally um, to the point now where uh, a good example is a graded um, MS67 one Bitcoin Casasius brass coin um, will sell at 1.1, which is actually kind of small. But then um, over time, now this is where that thing about collectors, this is why collectors key into this is like, well, if you sit on it 20 years and lots of people in the meantime peel that Bitcoin because it's become worth lots of money, then because there are fewer and especially fewer that are graded, um, then yours up by axiom becomes worth more money. Now, naturally, that will still only be a dollar premium, but you are technically still making money. It, it's a very strange landscape ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of just everybody forming their own, you know, kind of ideologies and just seeing how that goes. And, you know, th th this, this, I think, is, you know, kind of a big shift point I wanted to uh, to make here and kind of, I think, jump into, like, some of the actual communities, you know what I mean? Because everybody it just generalizes, like, you know, the the poker community or like the, the collectible community but the, 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 there is no homogenous community there well there's i mean i think the the place where it all began is probably the best place to start funnily enough um is the collectibles uh, section on bitcoin talk forum it it is the main center point for the vast majority of bitcoin collectibles um old and new through time and has and i've inhabited that board since what 2013 um and if you want something that's been made and it's uncommon then your best chance is likely to be there um you do get other slack groups that fire up um where some of the collectors have made their own because obviously some of these guys circulate this stuff goes round and round in circles in some respects as they and trade it and sell it and move it around um to some some people some of the collectors some of this stuff is commodity or and or they'll speculate on the value of that collectible so they'll buy say five of an item at once then keep two and sell three on um hopefully at a profit depending on what happens with the price of bitcoin and what they've paid and has bitcoin did they pay in bitcoin and all the usual variables um so, yeah, so there are uh, various Slack groups that have also popped up and then some of the collectors get to meet up in person at various conferences, um, which brings us kind of nicely back around to a car part of the conversation we had earlier about trust. Um, and when you've met someone, as you, you know, from the, the various gigs that you go to, there are people that you trust a lot more having met them than you would if you'd only just talk to them mm -hmm. as we are talking now. So, um, and, and it's a time thing. Again, time, time keeps coming into a lot of what I've been talking about lately about um, the maturation of collectibles, the maturation of art um, and, and things. Trust is also built up over time. Um, so, yeah, that, that's how specifically we, we, we've kind of built up a community so that certain things are handled within certain groups so that we have secure channels um and ultimately
ultimately yeah <laughs> you, you we get new users in and that's where it gets interesting because obviously if you're starting to send goods out worth multiple thousands of, of dollars worth um you want to make sure they arrive and that uh, everything's safe it's a part of the conversation that has grown within the um more old school collectors about how the new school collectors are managed because um they are you know some of these people are have a lot of money they want to get involved they've just got in like we did all those years ago or do they get on the on-ramp of what we used to do um and am i as a seller for example happy sending anything like ten, say a couple of coins which are potentially worth twenty thousand dollars through the mail you know that, that's a bit of a steep conversation yeah that sounds like a lot of uh a lot of trade-offs to analyze there. Well, the the current one is that um, as as value climbs, then it's like with um, stocks and shares and anything, any financial instrument or anything else, you factor in risk. And part of that risk in this particular case is not actually risk, but cost of movement. And so it's hand delivery via a flight. We meet up in London or Amsterdam or New York or wherever the handover is. And you, you meet in the airport and you get a personal handover because it that way it's safer. Um, so, yeah, that's the kind of area that's being discussed now with the higher value collectibles um, because they're small. They're worth a lot of money. And it's easy for things to go wrong very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Not even any kind of malicious thing, just something gets lost or damaged in the mail. Somebody throws it out and pretends it doesn't happen. Yeah, it's then, happened. What? It's happened. Yeah, we, we've. I there, there's at least two um, of the old school collectors that I know of that have had. Well, one had what was it about three? and a half bitcoin go missing in one consignment and another guy had a, a couple of bitcoin go missing so it does happen was it malicious as you say was it malicious was it by design or was it just pure accident we don't know but that, that obviously from his point of view he doesn't own them mm -hmm. and so like like each each community in in this space like there's always like flashpoints there's shit that that just tribal lines get drawn and shit starts getting formed. You know what I mean? Like in in the, the overall Bitcoin ecosystem, like the the block size is one of those things. You know, you look at the the Bcash community and it's the uh, the canonical transaction ordering, Ethereum, like proof of stake versus proof of work. Like what what are some of like the those those flashpoints? in the collectible space that 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 just has those, those stark ideological lines well i think it would be i think it would be very fair for me to say knowing my, my colleagues my compatriots my friends fellow collectors and the people i've done business with for the last couple of years since forks and the like to say pretty much to a man and a woman um they are B btc this whole fork business has been like get the fuck out of here <laughs> um, it's been pretty binary to be brutally honest and then of course bsv well let's not even be there because it's not worth anyone's time they are pretty much maximalists although obviously many are traders they mess about with altcoins and in fact some of the alt stuff that's been made for altcoins which isn't something we've talked about but it does have a voice in the space love it or hate it um some of the collectible items made for other coins there's some good stuff out there but yes i i would um be very confident in saying that the collects are, are maximalists pretty much first it's um everything they own is bitcoin and there was a there was a vague attempt at one point in time for people to load in all the premium value um with added fork coin value yay it didn't fly um and in fact most sales these days have kind of gone back to how it used to be which is nobody cares about the fork value they really don't um yeah i i think to be brutally honest most people have moved on
That is actually pretty fucking hilarious. Uh, well, there goes. Uh, yeah, I guess I don't need to make sure that all those blockchains uh, stay around so I can prove premium value exists on my one poker trip. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, how about investing theses? Like, I know that there's got to be some some pretty different schools of thought in terms of that long term in this space. Absolutely, it, it's quite simple. If you believe Bitcoin is a better investment long term than the piece of work that you're buying, why are you buying the piece of work? It's that simple. Um, <laughs> that's being brutally honest and, and sterile about it but then uh, art has this funny effect of making people emotional and see one must have um and so then it, it, it's about when you're making that buying decision um what are you buying it with if you're buying it with bitcoin the chances are reasonably high you're it's, it's the ten thousand bitcoins for a pizza conversation isn't it at the time it was nothing later on it's 93 million dollars so you know i pay half a bitcoin for this particular work now and it turns out that 10 years later that same work of art is essentially worth 50 million would i get 50 million for that work well there's a good question probably not but then who's it by is crypto graffiti the new andy warhol of the crypto scene is josie bellini we don't know it it it's <laughs> BSE Femaxes or something else here, aren't they? Just um, it's 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 a kind of a judgment call. It's a, it, that's that conversation area about what makes art valuable. Who who decides? Well, the market decides. And I love crypto graffiti. I know other people that don't. So you know, uh, through time, we'll see. All right, and I guess. Uh... Uh, 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 let's shift gears a little bit again. I've, I've been avoiding it till now, I guess, but you called me out on it. What 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 kind of you know collectible stuff is being done with with some of the shit coins out there? Well, <laughs> yeah, there's there's a few. <laughs> um. There's uh, Lealana um, and Cassasius both did stuff for Litecoin. That's some of that stuff oh. is quite collectible. Um, and some, funny enough, in dollar premium terms, actually, some of that Litecoin Lealana is doing quite well. So this is uh, this is where you kind of you, you get that collectibles market taking over, be above and beyond the crypto part of the deal it's because it's collectible um and and it, it it's that thing about what kind of who, who does it what breed are we we are the collectors well we pay because we are collectors and so it's of its type and and so you buy it and lealana is one particular one in 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 case um but yeah, there, there's also, what was it? Crypto Kaiju is a popular one at the moment. Come, uh, a bunch of guys in Manchester, I think, they're making, um, uh, was it manga or anime? Kaiju inspired um, ERC20 tokens. And you've got this physical item and it's it's tied to um, a token. That's kind of cute. Um, what else is there? Um, did, 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 did. Yeah, well, and various other cards i think you've got the ether legends cards is one of the other big popular ones at the moment seems that everybody's exploring and experimenting on the yeah crypto kaiju that's it most people are experimenting on the erc 20 stuff um and is it erc 27 one i think it is um collectible vinyl toys yeah it, it again we get actually get back to that point about the only limit at the moment seems to be imagination people are trying to find stuff to tokenize and go for it you know one thing i was kind of disappointed in spells of genesis you remember that yeah that's not one i got into i must admit uh, not i don't know if it was before it wasn't before my time but i just really didn't pay that much attention it's kind of hoping for magic the gathering 
except tokenized. And it wound up just being some stupid hybrid like arcade game on a smartphone that I, I still don't think they've actually rolled out blockchain like card asset integration into the game. Yeah, I, like I said earlier, we are at the vanguard, the bleeding edge. In fact, we're running along the razor blade of the bleeding edge. We've got bloody feet. There's going to be losses. <laughs> there's going to be things that fuck up and there's going to be things that just don't work. They were great ideas, but they were so badly executed. And I, and I think we've, we've still got some time to go. And to be br brutally honest, if it's taken Bitcoin 10 years to get here, it's going to be at least another 10 years before we see the kind of stuff that we really want and the stuff that I think we'd actually trust. And that kind of ties in nicely with a lot of what's been talked about here is about the trust element. Um, you know, if you're going to, this stuff's going to be worth money. And like, as we know, gaming is all very much, you know, micropayments and all this kind of stuff. Um, and it's not all one way. You don't just mine stuff out of thin air and they give you free money. You usually think even on a micro level to get involved. Um, so trust. It, yeah, it, it's going to be an interesting future in that respect. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's see. Two, three. Let's, let's, let's shift gears again and kind of disconnect from the, the tokenized stuff. Uh, I'm sure you have a lot of uh, pieces crypto graffiti's made over the years. You'd like to talk about, like, you know, what, like, what, what's kind of going on and like been going on in the just the pure art space, like the not tokenizing and like tying assets to things, just like the the pieces of art. Well, it's definitely a, a burgeoning space there's absolutely no doubt about that you've got artists like vesa um, nelly um crypto graffiti um josie even though she, and josie's obviously an interest and trevor jones they're interesting because they are physical art and their physical works in their own right are great um but they've got that ar element but the physical keeping to the physical it, it's definitely a, a growing market Will we see it in Sotheby's or Christie's in the next five years? Oh, that's a tough call. Possibly towards the end of the five years. I, um, but again, it's early. A lot of uh, one of the issues I have with certain pieces of art is the slap a bee on it idea, where people will just literally do the Bitcoin bee and go, "Well, there you go. <laughs> that's a job done." <laughs> and it's like is that it you know literally it's like a black canvas with some orange acrylic paint and you're done and it's like well it's not really expressive is it you know but to be fair to people that do put a b on it and and a good case in point actually is a guy called ryr german artist i actually own a couple of his pieces that are quite literally bees on it um but the key point with his work is the fact that the, he's made the paper from shredded and pulped euros and pound notes and then screen printed on top of that the b and also gold highlighted on it so it's that it, he's taking it to a slightly different level by doing it on fiat paper that's probably one of the only reasons i've given it the exception um but yeah it i think the most successful artists will be the ones that that actually get it that that have like i think i said this earlier that see bitcoin conceptually rather than just there's not another money you know or or just a, a symbol a b it's you know like people see the dollar sign or the pound sign they see the bitcoin sign and then that's it that's all they see they don't see beyond what bitcoin could be is and all the rest of it mm -hmm. You know, like th this is kind of one of the areas where I, I think is like serious potential to just mainstream because like two, you know, two pieces of crypto graffiti that stand out in my mind are that that swan piece where he specifically made the point out of like the lowest. Yeah, thing. the lightning. Yeah, the black swan lightning payment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a m master stroke. This is one of the reasons why I think. 
as an artist, crypto graffiti will be one of the first to reach the heights of artistic um, heavens, whatever you want to call it, because he goes for exactly those kind of things. He, he looks for specific motivations or drivers or aspects of the technology and is using it, promoting it, driving it. It's, yeah, it's masterful. Mm -hmm. And then like the, the Venezuelan piece with the, uh, the Venezuelan notes, like and yep. just digging at Maduro like that, that like that speaks to so much more than just Bitcoin. Like that, that is taking the core of things in that direction of the mainstream. Well, absolutely. In fact, um, that, that work he did on the wall in Venezuela, I have to say I'm a proud donator and a proud owner of one of the notes that came off that wall. Um, but it's, in fact, one of the things that I do uh, as, as, a, as a collector is I also hunt out art talent. Um, and I found a particular Venezuelan artist and I've, I've been commissioning and supporting him um quite a lot over the last six nine about nine months now um and buying lots of work to ensure that you know he he gets well i'll pay him through paypal and i know he gets dollars in the end so um and he does some outstanding work but we we finally had the conversation about look can i not pay you in paypal because this is great and all but it's not doing you any favors can we pay you in bitcoin or can i pay you in bitcoin and so we had the conversation and i started him down the road of bitcoin ownership um and one of his obvious first questions funnily enough was how can i turn that into money so that i can buy food um and so we found a bitcoin atm um nearby um i think actually the closest one at the time was in colombia but there's actually been one open in venezuela since um and and so yeah it, it, it's a powerful technology and a powerful message that's one of the reasons i do bitcoin in the first instance is because it enables people like um jose in venezuela to to be able to rise above their their rulers and and their regimes Mm -hmm. i mean that's that's fucking awesome dude like that really is but it's like that's that's the kind of message that some of these artists are really taking like it's not just about the, the put a b on it it's about what is this gonna actually do and like th there's no more powerful way to spread a message than art You're absolutely right. And in fact, um, I've currently got, and I'm going to be, do a bit of shameless promotion here. I do apologize in advance. I have an auction going on on the Bitcoin Talk collectible section at the moment for a work of art that's a collaboration between myself and RYR, who I mentioned earlier, who does the pulped fiat. Um, and it's a work of art called 21, um, which is obviously a comment on the 21 million Bitcoins that will ever be mined. Um, and all proceeds from that auction are to go to Free Ross, um, it's, uh, uh, which is a very worthy cause, I think. Uh, I'm not sure how other people feel, but I personally feel that, that is, the guy deserves a, a, another shot. Um, so yeah, head over to Bitcoin Talk um, and bid on my auction there for the 21 work of art. All proceeds to Free Ross. Uh, actually, like, dude, plug that away all you want and um, make sure I get a link to that afterwards to give to people. And for those of you not familiar with Bitcoin Talk, um, there's a kind of built-in reputation system where you can kind of see how long somebody's been there, how trusted they are in the community. So, um, you know, that's something to consider if you want to look into this. Yep you got it um it's uh so yeah it, it reputation <laughs> i just see someone uh, post up it's we work hard to earn it but it's very easily lost 
Um, one of the things about Bitcoin is, is if you say it, it bonds you by your word, if you say you've done it and you sent it, then it's very easy to prove that you haven't. It's one of the things I've always enjoyed about um, working in this space is it does keep all the players honest and you soon find out who the charlatans are. Mm -hmm. You just need uh, more people to realize that's how things work. <laughs> give them time, my boy. Give them time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, I mean, I think I'm kind of plumbed out through the whole outline that I set up. So, I mean, is there uh, anything you want to get into? Well, I would say um, collectibles are those funny things. I would hazard a guess that most of the people listening at some point in time have been to a conference maybe some of you went to a very early conference and picked up some bits and pieces maybe a mug or a t-shirt or a pen or or a mine or something um, you may be miners you may have actually have picked up a coin um, all of that stuff that you've gathered up through time becomes valuable because they are signposts of history. They are little markers in time um, that with such stuff as this kind of world changing technology, it will become important later. A lot of stuff that people trash and throw away and go, ah, oh, yeah, well, it's pretty sad this day, isn't it? Who cares? Um, some of that stuff becomes quite valuable. It really does. So don't just think twice before you throw anything out and, and check what you've got, because you never know. There might, might be that little gem in your in your box or, or your attic. Mm -hmm. All right. So I guess on that note, uh, you know, thanks for agreeing to do this, Physique. I know it's uh, been a little uh, while since we were talking about this because my schedule has been hectic, but this has been really fun, man. Like, I think uh, most of the listeners will enjoy it. You're most welcome, and, and thanks very much for an interesting conversation. Mm -hmm. All right, so on that note, adios, punks. We'll catch you later. Yeah, it's a